Good afternoon. It's great to have you with us today. Today I want to talk about a subject that uh, I've been talking about on Sunday nights in our church for the last three Sunday evenings. And it deals with the subject of our adversary, the devil. Now, when it comes to that subject, there are a lot of people who make all kinds of mistakes about him. Some like to joke about him, as old Flip Wilson used to do it. He used to say, the devil made me do it. And then there are others who think the devil isn't a real person, and so they ignore him. But both of these responses can be very dangerous things for us to do. Now, when it comes to the subject of the devil, we have to rely upon the scriptures to tell us some things about him. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against those that are spirit beings in the realm of our mind. And if we don't understand what the scriptures have to say, we're very likely to be constantly overcome by the devil as believers. And it's very sad that a lot of Christians have not been instructed concerning this enemy, the spiritual enemy of the devil. We have two other enemies, the sin nature that we all still have in spite of what some are being, some men are teaching. And we also have the present world system with which we must contend. But the Apostle Paul warned Timothy just before he died, and he said that in the, last, in the latter times, people would depart from the faith and give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. They would speak lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They would tell people not to engage in marriage and abstain from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. This is found in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He also, in his second letter, just before he died, told Timothy to preach the word with authority, to be in season and out of season, to reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine, because the time would come when men would not endure sound doctrine. We're living in those days right now. Many of these mega churches have go there because the, the leader or the pastor tells them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. Now, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 5, he was well aware of what had happened in his own personal life, so he speaks from personal experience to the, particularly in chapter 5, he talks to the elders or the bishops, the, that is the overseers of the church, who we would call the pastor teachers, and he, tell, he tries to encourage them because they're under persecution as well as other people are. And so he writes them, he tells them, now, you need to do the work that God wants you to do. You need to shepherd the flock. You need to feed them. You need to guide them. You need to guard them. You need to heal them. And he says, uh, you need to serve as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords or dictators over those who are entrusted to you, but rather being examples to them. And he says, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. This is one of the five crowns that are mentioned in the scriptures. And then he tells in verse number five, he tells the younger people to submit themselves, put themselves, put themselves at the disposal of those who are maturing in the faith, uh, pastor teachers and teachers in the church and older men and women. Uh, scripture says that older Christian women who have matured need to teach the younger, and likewise older men need to teach the younger ones. And then he says in verse number 6 of First uh, Peter 5, he says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your cares upon him. Why? He cares. God cares for you. He says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brethren, by your brotherhood in the world. Folks, things are going to get more and more difficult for those who are Bible-believing Christians, and we need to understand that behind many, much of this opposition are spirit beings. Uh, the devil is the highest of God's created beings. He's a cherub. He's not an angel. He's a cherub. He was the beautiful one. He still is a beautiful one. He can appear as an angel of light. And he, uh, there are many things that are said about him. Now, we don't have time to develop all of the ideas that are found here in the scriptures concerning the devil, but I just want to share some of the things with you that I shared with our folks here, particularly in the light of the times in which we live, because there's a lot of people who are being deceived by false teachers. In fact, um, Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, wanted to write about the common salvation. He says, but the Holy Spirit redirected me to write about the dangers of the false teachers that would come and deceive Christians. Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 2, he writes about false teachers. Paul writes about them. The Apostle John warns, he says, don't, just because somebody claims to be a Christian, test them, try the spirits. 
to see whether they are indeed of God. We don't need people with a discerning of spirit, that spiritual gift today. We just need to know the Word of God so that if somebody comes and teaches a doctrine that is contrary to the clear teachings of the Word of God, we can say, no, that's not part of the Scriptures. That's not true. That's not correct. You see, because a lot of these apostates... Now, I need to differentiate between an apostate and a heretic. Uh, Dr. H. Laverne Schaefer, in his book called the Maturing in Christ, has done a wonderful job uh, in differentiating be between the two. Heresy is a misapplication of the truth primarily. It's a work of the flesh. Both saved and unsaved people can teach heresy or believe heresy. However, an apostate is some, someone who has professed faith in Jesus Christ, but who never was a true believer in, in the Lord Jesus Christ by believing that he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. You see, a person can know the gospel, a person can believe the gospel without personally transferring his or her faith over to the person and work of Christ and thereby be saved. Now, there's a lot of people in our world who don't know the good news concerning Christ, his death and his resurrection. They don't even know that. And that's where we need to come in, and you and I need to share the gospel with them, with them, with whatever means that we have, legitimate means whereby we have to share that with them so that they can be saved by believing in Christ and his death for our sins and his burial and resurrection. Now, these false teachers, there are plenty of them out there today. And uh, it's, it's really sad because a lot of people are buying into the philosophy that some of these guys are teaching. They, some of them have been to Bible college, some of them have even been to seminary. I knew a man who supposedly you know, knew Greek and Hebrew just really well. And In fact, I don't know how people do this, but I heard of a man who memorized, who could memorize the Bible. Now, some of them obviously have, would have to have a photographic memory. I don't know I have the Bible memorized, but I think I know a little bit more than maybe some people do. But there's so much more for me to learn, so I want to keep on studying, keep on learning, and then applying it to my own life and helping people apply it to their lives. So we know that most of the people in the world According to 1 John 5, 19, most of the unsaved people in the world are just lulled to sleep like a mother rocks her baby to sleep and they just are not aware of what's happening in the world around them. But in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 2, the Apostle Paul says they are mature sons of disobedience who know what they're doing. And they are agents of the devil and they are propagating false doctrine to people or doctrines of demons. And it's very important for us to be students of the Word. This Word, the Word of God, is God-breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. See, this is the book that needs to guide our lives, not the philosophies of this world. One of the tragedies of today is there are those who are called integrationists who take the Bible but say, oh, it's not quite enough. You need the psychology, the, the philosophies of men, you know, to subsidize. Well, what? What the, for 1,900 years people were the Bible was sufficient to meet their needs. Second Peter, Second uh, Peter chapter one verse four says we have everything that we need for life and godliness right in this book. The problem is people don't study to show themselves approved to God. They'd rather have somebody tell them what they want to hear to tickle their ears. Oh, you're so wonderful when they're not. Would you want a doctor that you go? You got a problem? You go in to see the doctor? Would you want him to tell you the truth, or would you want him to lie about you and then die? See. Now, we as Christians need to realize some of the tactics of the devil, and I just want to share with you some of these things. And uh, there's, I cannot exhaust it all in the brief period of time that I have here, but I came across a commentary, the Holman Commentary, in uh, first, first and Second Peter, uh, and I have adapted some of this from Max Anders and, and another fellow. And I just wanted to share some highlights with you and, and comment upon a few things. But concerning the devil's activities, now keep in mind he's a spirit being. He's far more powerful than you and I are. He's been observing mankind for some 6,000 years. He knows us well. Now, he's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything there is to know. See, And if you, you know, he can observe you, he can listen to you. There are spirit beings in this world today and right in this room right now, good angels and bad angels. And they can hear what I'm saying. They can watch you as you listen to me. And they cannot read your thoughts, though. And so sometimes it's better to just be quiet. You know, than to express yourself, but they can. And so they'll put a thought in your mind if you're a believer and see how you respond to it. And if they get a gateway or an entryway into that, they'll try to proceed, you know, and try to ruin your life, not by lose, causing you to lose your salvation, but losing the joy of your salvation and your effectiveness in your service to God.
Now, let me just share some of these things that I shared with our folks recently. Uh, one of the things that the devil does, he likes to provoke people to sin. Uh, we find in 1 Chronicles chapter uh, 21, where Satan came to King David as he was maturing in the faith. Remember, he was the appointed one by God. He was, um, he was appointed by God. He was loved by God. And the Lord appointed him through Samuel to become the king of Israel. And uh, David made some serious mistakes in his life, and he paid the consequences for the rest of his life. But he was a man after God's own heart. But as he was probably getting older, he was tempted by the devil to act independently of God or self to be self-sufficient in the army that he had. And so the devil tempted him to number his army to, for him to rely upon his army rather than his primary reliance to be on God. And so we find from 1 Chronicles chapter 21 that, say, that uh, day, King David did yield to this temptation. And he, he went against the advice of his general and he numbered the men. And because of that, God said, you have succumbed to the temptation from the devil, and you have a choice to make. And as a result of the choice that David made, 70,000 of King David's men died because of a decision that he had made. Now, you know, that's a very terrible thing to happen. One man's decision, all those 70,000 men died. Now, you know, we have people in power today. We have our presidents and our rulers and our dictators around the world. And their decision can result in millions of people dying. You think about World War I, World War II, Korean War. You, you've got the guy in North Korea right now who's threatening the United States that if we fire one bullet, he's going to blast off nuclear weapons on us. You know, our world is very volatile you know, right now. And it's a very dangerous position. Now, we know from the scriptures that in the future, which could be just around the corner, folks, what's called the 70th week of Daniel, mentioned in Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 27. The 70th week of Daniel is actually seven years that are going to come right after the church is taken out of here. Or shortly thereafter, when the Antichrist signs an agreement with the Jewish people, he will protect them or promise to protect them for seven years. And during the first three and a half years of that peace agreement that he has with the Jewish people. The Jews are going to dwell in safety and prosperity in the land of Israel, whereas all around them, there are going to be people dying terribly. See, And in fact, from Revelation chapter 6 and chapter 9, we know that during this seven-year period of time that over one half of the population of the world is going to die. Now, figuring three, seven billion people on planet Earth today, that means over three and a half billion, that's with a B, billion people are going to die, and even more than that during that whole period of seven years. Now, if God did not restrict man, so if it went any longer than seven years, the scriptures tell us that no flesh would survive. You see, on our planet today, and at the resources of just a pushing a button, people, the rulers of this world, could destroy, they have so many weapons of mass destruction, biological, chemical, nuclear weapons, they could easily wipe off every living creature on this earth. But God is not going to allow men to do that. He's going to say, that's enough, and he's going to put an end to it just before uh, Jesus Christ comes back to rule as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, Jesus Christ, when he comes back at Armageddon, that's the place in northern Israel. Now, I've seen uh, recently, I saw a movie, and it talks about Armageddon and this, you know, this asteroid or whatever coming, and these guys that are drillers, they go up in there and they blast it. That's not what Armageddon's all about. Armageddon has to do, the campaign of the Battle of Armageddon has to do with all the nations of the earth converging in on Israel to try to wipe them off the face of the earth once and for all. And as they come together from the east and the west and the north and the south, Jesus Christ has come back from heaven, and all these groups are going to get together to try to fight against Jesus Christ, and he's going to wipe them out. And the Jews, the believing Jews are going to be spared, and the, and the believers, of some of the Gentiles, will be preserved. And they are the ones who will repopulate the earth. Well, anyway, so the devil, you know, he does, he did provoke um, King David to number his men, and that was not what God wanted him to do, and 70,000 men died as a result of that. Furthermore, furthermore we know from Job chapter 1 and, verse, and, cha and chapter 2 that the devil... He roams around the earth. Now, he can see you, but you can't see him. But he roams around the earth looking for people that he can try to ruin. And there was a man by the name of Job. He was a patriarch. And he lived in the Old Testament times. He was an upright man. 
And one day, God and the devil got into a discussion about Job. And God said, have you noticed my servant Job down there? And the devil said to the Lord, well, the only reason why Job serves you is because you bless him. I said, that's not true. Well, then you take away everything that he has, and he'll curse you. God said, no, I won't do it, but I'll let you do it. And that's when the devil went to town, so to speak, and he wiped out everything that Job had. He was a wealthy man. And not only that, but he killed all of Job's ten children. You talk about trauma in a guy's life and trauma in his wife's life who said to him, curse God and die. Why did he allow this to happen to us? And Job responded by saying, I will not curse God. Now when Job, at the end of the book, God restores to him double what he had before, poor old Mrs. Job had to have ten more children and go through all the agony of childbirth. Maybe that was her punishment for telling her husband to curse God and die. We're not to do that no matter how bad things get. We're to trust the true and living God because Paul says in Romans 8, 18, the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us one day. Yeah, we'll suffer in this world. Jesus said, they've persecuted me. They're going to persecute you too. What do you think? You're better than the master? You know. Now, if you preach the gospel consistently and you Preach it in its entirety. You're going to run into opposition. Paul said that to, in fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he told Timothy, he said, Now, Timothy, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has enlisted him as a soldier. Now, he talks about an athlete. He talks about the farmer. And he says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now you see, the bodily resurrection is a very important doctrine. The bodily resurrection. There are some cults that say, no, he didn't rise again bodily. The scriptures teach the bodily resurrection. Go to Luke chapter 24. Very clear. Also in 1 Corinthians 15. It was a bodily resurrection. If it wasn't a bodily resurrection, folks, there is no hope for us in the future. Now, Paul writes here, he says, For which, because I insist on the resurrection, the bodily resurrection, as being part of the gospel message that, is, that will result in a person's being saved if they believe on Christ through this message, he says, For which I suffer as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore, verse 10, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now, I'll be honest with you. I've never been whipped like Paul was or like Jesus was. And, uh, you know, today they would probably, the people that are opposed to are preaching the good news concerning... You see, if you're not preaching the gospel clearly, as a lot of these guys on radio and TV, I mean, they mess up the gospel so badly. They tell you to do all kinds of stuff except to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ through the message of the gospel that he died for our sins and rose again. That's it, see. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 2, there are many who are believing in vain by adding all kinds of other conditions. There's one guy who takes James chapter 4, verse 7 to 10, and he says, there are 10 things that you must do. This is part of your salvation. He puts discipleship or spiritual maturity rules as conditions for salvation. That's not how you get saved. Those are how you grow spiritually. And you don't, if you don't separate those things, you're going to be a very frustrated individual. Now, you see, teaching the Word of God it carries with it serious responsibilities, and we need to recognize it. No, the gospel message is very simple. We need to keep it simple. And if you're a preacher who is uh, listening to my voice right now, and you're not presenting the gospel, you're leaving out part of the gospel, shame on you. Paul says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. To Jews and Gentiles, we don't distinguish between, you know, we don't say, okay, you Jews, you have, you are a different covenant. You get saved a different way than we Gentiles. No, that's a heresy. That's called dual covenant. No, there's a guy that, that teaches that. That's not true. The same gospel must be believed by Jewish people and Gentile people if they're to be saved. Paul said it's this gospel, Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, there are more Gentiles, non-Jews, that are being saved than Gentiles are, and that is in part due to the blindness that God has imposed, or the blindness people have. Now, there are three kinds of blindnesses that you need to keep in mind. There's satanic blindness. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that when you present the gospel to somebody that he died for our sins, was buried and rose again, Satan will try to cover up their eyes so they can't see and believe and be saved. See? And then there's a natural blindness that everybody has who's born into this world. It doesn't make any difference whether you're Jew or Gentile. You have this natural blindness. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says the natural man, the unsaved man, does not welcome the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. 
But then there's a third kind of blindness that's called judicial blindness that is imposed upon Jewish people as a whole because of the rejection of Jesus Christ as their promised Messiah some 2,000 years ago. Now, we need to keep in mind that greater is he, the Holy Spirit, who is in us than he who is in the world. And he can overcome these blindnesses that people have. You can't do it by persuasiveness. You must rely upon the Holy Spirit to do his work of opening the spirit, opening the eyes so they can see and believe. See. But you are the one responsible, if you're a Christian, to share the good news of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for our sins, not because you're such a wonderful person, but for our sins, and when they believe in Christ, they will be saved. Now, in Satan's arsenal, he has identified, we believe there are 14 identifiable darts that he throws or casts at our minds. Now, Dr. L. Uh, Ace Laverne Schaefer has written a very good book that I would encourage you to do. And it's called Maturing in Christ, and he talks about all three spiritual enemies, and he goes in quite a bit of detail. But he identifies 14 specific areas where the devil can attack you. Now, you see, if you think that, if you blame everything on the devil, you're going to be a constantly defeated Christian. You need to understand that you have three spiritual enemies, and each of these has different rules to overcome the enemy. It's just like, let me illustrate it. In basketball, football, and baseball, you have different rules, right? With reference to the devil, you, after you've recognized that he's attacking you in a certain area, you submit yourself to God, you take the arm, you be sober, you be vigilant, you submit to God, and in the process of your submitting to God, you take him on the armor and resist him and overcome him with reference to the sin nature that you all have, I have. Now these guys that are going around saying, once you get saved, you get rid of your sin nature. No, you don't. First John 1 John 1.8 makes it very clear that we still have a sin nature, and we can engage in all the activities that we did prior to our being saved, and we can do it even in a worse way, because we'd have to run from the Holy Spirit to do these things. But if you don't acknowledge the fact that you have a sinful nature, even as a Christian, you're going to fall and, and be very ineffective in your service to God. You recognize it. You learn how to walk by means of the Spirit so you don't give in to the temptation. You see, it's not the temptation. The song says, it's right. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you somehow to win. So fight manfully onward, dark passion subdue. Look ever to Jesus, and he'll carry you through. So, with reference to the devil, you stand and fight. The sin nature, you run. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 22. He says, flee youthful lust. Now you think, oh man, nobody will see. Don't you kid yourself for one moment. King David thought he could hide from God. He looked at a beautiful woman. He lusted after her. He, he took him to himself. He committed adultery with her. He had her husband killed. The baby died. You talk about consequences. Yeah, God forgave him. He was guilty of murder. God did forgive him. God forgave other men who were guilty of murder. Moses was guilty of murder. Other people have been guilty of murder. Paul the Apostle was guilty of murder. He was consenting to the death of Christians. You know, I feel in some ways, you know, we all like to blame women for aborting their babies, but sometimes it's a man who's pushing the woman to abort her baby. Oh, well, it's just, it's just a fetus. It's not real. If I can use a Greek word, baloney. That's murder. But God can and will forgive those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. You may have been guilty of this. God can forgive, but that doesn't mean that you will not have um, problems in your mental thinking for the rest of your life. That won't happen until you get your new glorified body. And we were talking about this the other night in our Bible study. And I believe from uh, Isaiah 65, 17, that we know for sure from eternity future on out, that all the things that we did here in this life are going to be wiped out so that you won't have to have spend eternity. Oh, man, I wish I hadn't done that thing. See? Right now you have the grief that comes along. Now, there are 14 ident identifiable things, I believe, that we can attribute to the devil. Disappointment, discouragement, and doubt. You know, doubt itself is not a sin, but doing something while doubting, according to first Romans chapter 14, verse 23, is a sin. And there are very effective tools that the devil uses to try to defeat Christians and make them ineffective in their service to God. Now, I would challenge you to think about, you know, the four, could you identify 14 identifiable things that come from the devil? Now, not only this, but whenever we try to evangelize lost people with the good news concerning Christ, the devil will try to trip you up any way that he can. 
You see, he doesn't want to lose people out of his kingdom. And uh, let me just share something on the sideline that just came to my mind. You see, if you had four people, Adam and Eve, uh, Cain and Abel, you got those four, and one kills off another, you got three people left. That's one-fourth of the population wiped out. And that, by the way, is why we believe Satan devised the present world system back in Genesis chapter 4. You can relate that to Luke chapter 11, and it goes all the way back to the blood of Abel. That's when he devised the world system to try to control the sin nature of man so that man wouldn't... Now, the devil is a murderer. He's a liar and he's a murderer, but he's a very select one. See? And so he devised the world system to try to control men so that they wouldn't wipe you know, wipe the whole population off the planet Earth. See, Now, the devil does have control over one-third of the angelic beings that followed him in his rebellion against God. Now, we know which category they are from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12. They're the lower two categories, like the uh, sergeants and the privates, rather than the generals and the, and the captains. The lower two categories, the principalities and powers, those are the ones we wrestle against. Now, they're more powerful than we are, and they can... They can be just as effective as the devil would be were he attacking us in the area of our mind. So we need to be aware of these things. So he'll throw these fiery darts at you. He'll try to thwart the work of God. Uh, he'll try to devour Christians. He'll try to take advantage of Christians. Uh, in Second Corinthians chapter or First Corinthians chapter one verse five, it talks about this guy who is a believer. He's a saved man. He's living in Corinth, but he does a terrible thing in that he commits adultery or immorality with his mother or his stepmother. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, he says, what are you people doing? Are you crazy? He says, why, even the unsaved people don't do such a terrible thing. He says, I want you to put that guy out of the fellowship of your church. So the church is okay, and they put him out. Well, the guy is being a Christian, and he's yielded to the sin nature. He's out there. He's lonely. He's not, he, he doesn't feel comfortable, and he's, he's, he doesn't feel comfortable because he's a Christian. He's headed for heaven, but he's committed a terrible sin. So he discerns what he's done. That's the first thing you have to do. Then he repents. That's a change of mind. And then he confesses his sins to God, and he's forgiven. But the church is hesitant to forgive him. And so Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and he says, Now, folks, he says, This guy has committed, has committed this terrible sin. I know. And it's stained your reputation. But he says, I have forgiven him. You need to forgive him, too. Now, Paul, over in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, he says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, graciously forgiving others, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. My friend, nobody has sinned against you as grievously as you have sinned against God, and you have no reason to be, withhold forgiveness from another individual who has wronged you if that person apologizes and asks for your forgiveness. Now, you see, with, with God as his children, if we should confess our sins, he promises to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. However, with reference to people, when you sin against another person, you might go to that person and apologize and admit you were wrong, and that person say, okay, I'll forgive you, but I won't hold, I'll hold it against you. No, you have to go the second step, and you have to say, okay, if you're willing to forgive me, will you not hold it against me anymore? See, God won't do that. God doesn't forget anything, by the way. You'll hear a guy say, well, God forgives and he forgets. If he did, he's not omniscient. He cannot forget. He will not forget. But he won't hold it against you. Now, you need to realize that God might allow you to be tempted in the same area that you yielded so that you can demonstrate to him, according to James chapter 1, verse 12, that you love God more than you love this temptation to which you yielded because you derive pleasure from it, right? When you engage in immorality, for example, why do you do it? Because you think there's pleasure in it. Sure there's pleasure in it. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says that Moses forsook that stuff. He, he had the pleasures of Egypt all before him, but he left all that knowing that he was going to have to lead these people out into the wilderness. Man, how would you like Moses' job? Forty years with complaining, griping, grumbling Jews. And there are probably about three million of them, some of the estimates have been made. You got 600,000 fighting men, you got wives, you got three or four children. It could easily have been three or more, three or four million people. And he's 80 years old when he starts out on that job. Man, a liar. You talk about a reason to complain to God. And by the way, Moses did not enter into the promised land because when the Jews kept complaining, complaining about the no water situation, God said, now Moses, I want you to speak to the rock and water will come forth. Now the first time God said, strike the rock and water came forth. Now that's a lot of water. 
<coughs> but the second time, God says, speak to the rock. But Moses didn't obey God. And he says, must we bring forth water? Who? What do you mean? We. You, you didn't do that. God did. And Moses, instead of speaking to the rock, and God would have brought forth water, he strikes the rock. He strikes the rock. And God graciously brings forth water. But he takes Moses aside. He said, because you have done that, you're not going to go, you're not going to go into the promised land at this time. Now, we know from um, Matthew chapter 17 that Moses has been in the promised land on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's going to be in there in the promised land in the future, in the millennium. But he's not going to be the king on earth, as we know from Job chapter, uh, not Job, but Jeremiah chapter 30, I believe it's verse number 7 or verse 9. It says that David is going to be resurrected. He's going to be the reason here on earth over the Jews and over all other kings, lesser kings, that will be here on planet earth. Yes, there will be for a thousand years. We will be reigning with Christ from the new Jerusalem as his bride. Christ will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Underneath him will be King David and underneath him will be other kings all around the world that will be ruling over the people who still have their sin nature, even though it's curbed by virtue of the fact that all their needs are being met. But the devil won't be around during the time of the millennium, neither will the present world system that we have to struggle with uh, right now. Now, I must hasten on here, but as we think about Satan's future, I, heard, I came across an interesting sta statement recently, and it said, whenever the devil reminds you of your past that try to discourage you and cause you to just throw in the towel, this individual said, remind the devil of his future. You see, God has already determined the future of the devil and his angels, or the fallen angels, the demons. There is no salvation offered to the devil or his demons in spite of what false teachers are saying today in this idea of universal reconciliation. See, this is a heresy that's going around right now in the movies and in the book. And uh, it's not true. Matthew chapter 25, 41 says... That the, that the lake of fire was preserved, uh, was, uh, was created for the devil and his angels, but people go there too if they're unbelievers. That's the only unforgivable sin that will cause a person to end up in the lake of fire with the devil and his angels for 1,000 years. Now, you see, at the end of the tribulation time, the seven years of the tribulation, the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to be cast into the lake of fire. But the devil is going to be cast into the abyss, or in the sides, in the earth, in, in the abyss, like a big Grand Canyon. He's going to be cast there and bound by a private, somebody has suggested from Revelation chapter 20, verse 2, that he's going, God's going to use to humiliate the devil. He's going to use like a buck private to go and grab. He's going to have authority from, from God, from Christ, who has more authority than the devil. And by the way, you know from Jude that when Michael the archangel, the five-star general, gets in a conflict with the devil, he doesn't. the archangel doesn't rebuke the devil directly. He says, the Lord rebuke you because he recognized the superior power and authority that the devil had over him, the five-star general. See. But above it all is the Lord Jesus Christ himself who will say, all right, Buck Private Joe down there, I want you to go and grab the devil by the neck, so to speak, and I want you to cast him into the pit there and keep him down there for a thousand years. See. Well, that's what's going to happen. But then in, in uh, Revelation chapter 20, it says, after the thousand years, and by the way, it's a literal thousand years. These guys who, who change it and allegorize it and say, well, that's not what it means, and it, can't, it goes all the way back, I think, to about 300 A.D. when Constantine, you know, the emperor, he Christianized the world of the empire, and uh, the people thought that Jesus' kingdom had come. And so even though some of these guys will, you know, interpret the Bible normally, literally, historically, grammatically, in other parts of the Bible, when it comes to the future stuff, he said they just allegorize it. They change the whole meaning. Well, that's not what it means. Well, the allegorical method of interpretation goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, when the devil says to Eve, Has God said, is that what he really meant? Well, when she ate that fruit, and Adam ate that fruit, they found out real quickly that their garment of light was stripped away from them, and they began to die physically. Yeah, they lived a lot longer than we did. They lived almost 900-some years. And I believe in the future, in the millennium, when all the needs of man are provided, we don't have the curse... I mean, I'll tell you, i got some weeds in my backyard. Oh, pfft. I'm going to have a talk with Adam someday because he's responsible. You need that, you know, all the curse, the ground that got cursed. And it's, uh, you have to constantly fight all that stuff. 
Well, in the future, uh, Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years, and it says at the end of that period, after the devil is released for a brief period of time to gather all the rebels during the millennium who outwardly are submissive, because if they're not, they're going to get immediately cast into the lake of fire. These individuals will think, okay, this is our chance. We'll follow the devil, you know, Lucifer. And there's Luciferian doctrines out there today. And people without knowing it, or many of them are following the devil. But when they gather together, when he gathers all these people together, then it says that Jesus Christ is going to, as it were, zap them and send all those unbelievers down into the lake of fire, which never ends, folks. Now, that is not a pleasant thought to think about, and I don't want you in any way to think that I find pleasure in saying that. I do not. I evangelize people because I don't want them to go to that awful place. And by the way, there are no second chances. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed for man to die once, after which judgment comes. There are no second chances, in spite of what the cults and the false teachers are saying. There is no such thing as universal reconciliation. That's a lie. It's a doctrine of demons. And you must not believe it. In Titus chapter 1, verse 2, it says, God cannot lie. In his book, all scriptures God breathe. It's authoritative. You need to understand the difference between that, which is, you know, to be, all of it's to be believed, but not all of it's to be practiced. In Titus chapter 1 and verse number 9, it says there are two kinds of doctrines. There's those that are to be believed and practiced, and then there are those that are simply to be believed. And if you don't understand dispensation, the dispensational distinction between, for example, law, grace, and kingdom, if you don't know those distinctions, try to get into a Bible-believing church where the pastor does is a dispensationalist. You see, dispensation, dispensationalism is not a way of being saved. It's a result of a literal, historical, grammatical interpretation of the Bible. You just, when you read your newspaper, you take it literally, right? You take it for what it says, allowing for figures of speech. Oh, but we, you know, and people are so confused today. Well, part of it's the pastor's fault. Part of it's the people's fault. Because, they, you know, they, in fact, somebody told me the other day, you know, we need to have a bigger Internet thing with a, more megabytes because people use their, their computers and all this kind of... And I told the person, I said, well, you know, I'm not sure if they're watching, listening to me and reading the text or whatever, you know. But people used to bring their Bible to church. I got a Bible I've had for a long time. And I got quite a few... I, I think I got 20 or 30 Bibles. With, and by the way, uh, speaking of Bibles, if you don't have a good Bible, I would recommend that you get a Schofield Study Bible. And you can contact me. I can show you how you can get one um, inexpensively, well under $50. In fact, under $40, I think you can get one. I've had this one for about since about 2004, and I got a lot of notes in it. I have another one just like it, but I don't have the notes in it, uh, my own notes, that is. And Dr. Schofield did a wonderful job, and uh, I agree basically with most. If the notes are not inspired, by the way, only the scriptures are, and the scriptures are inspired or God-breathed as they accurately reflect the original Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. So I, we need to keep that in mind. Now, we need to realize that the devil not only can do all these things, but he can appear like an angel of light. He can deceive other demons, false, you know, other good angels. But the future of the devil is bleak. Uh, he's going to spend time in the abyss during the thousand-year reign of Christ. But uh, in the meantime, he, he and his agents are very active, and they're in, uh, trying to mess your life up. Now, the most important thing you need to start out with is make sure your call and election, make sure of that you're saved and headed for heaven. Don't be like those who believe in vain. And there are many people who believe in vain. But they say, well, you say, well, do you believe that Christ died for your sins and rose again? Yeah, I believe that. Are you trusting in him alone to save you? No. You could believe the gospel. You might, some people don't know the gospel. Some people say, yeah, I believe it. I, I give mental assent to that. But have you personally trusted in Christ? Have you transferred your your faith over to him alone, see. And if you're trusting in another cult Jesus, and there are plenty of them out there, it must be the Christ of the Scriptures who's the God-man, who's not inferior to the Father, who's not inferior to the Holy Spirit. They all share an equality as God. However, in time, Jesus Christ, the God-man, submitted himself to the Father and the Holy Spirit while he was here on earth. He goes back to heaven. He sits at the Father's right hand. They send the Holy Spirit down. The Holy Spirit is currently submissive to the Son and the Father. He's the resident here on earth. And you need to understand some of these things. But you need, you've got to be very careful because there are people today that are swallowing this lie. They're making up a God of their own image. As Romans chapter 1 says, you don't design your own, you don't have your own designer God. You must 
your thoughts about God must come from the scriptures and you don't put substance to God the Father and God the Holy Spirit because you don't know. God is a spirit. He's not a human being. He doesn't have a human body like Jesus does. Jesus has a body. Yes, he does. A glorified, resurrected body. And when our bodies become like him in the resurrection, it's going to be like his glorified humanity, not his deity, like some of the cults say, well, you can become a god and re repopulate other worlds. No, you can't. No, you won't. See? Now, i got to wrap it up here. You are either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. Every person, every child that is born in this world is born as a child of the devil. We know this from 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Jesus said to a group of religious men, scribes and Pharisees, He says, you guys are of your father the devil. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he said, Nicodemus, you're a religious man, you're a Pharisee, you know the Bible through and through, from Genesis to, to the Malachi, you know that well. He says, but you need to be born again from blah, blah. Says, How do I do that? Do I have to get it a second time in my mother's womb? Well, he, he was the teacher in Israel at that time. Now we know that he did, he did indeed become a believer because at the time of Christ's crucifixion, you know, he was responsible along with Joseph of Arimathea to take Christ's body down from the cross and put it in the tomb. And he wasn't planning on Jesus rising on the third day because he invested 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes to wrap up, in the, you know, the body. Now remember old Lazarus, he was dead for four days. His body started to decay. Jesus' didn't. That was a maximum amount of time that he could be dead in that tomb in Judea before his body would have started to rot. Well, anyway, you are either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. If you, you don't get saved by your being baptized, being sprinkled as a baby does not give you any more favor with God. I think it's one of di great disservice that people do for their children when they have them sprinkled as baby. Oh, well, now you're in this covenant relationship with God. No, you're not. You need to be born again from above. And the, the best time to tell a little child is, honey, when you're when you you inherited a sin nature from your parents, see, and you need to be saved. And if you can get saved early in life, the better. Learn how to live the Christian life. Be taught by a, a Bible believing pastor who can show you how to grow in the sphere of grace, how to serve God, so you don't waste your time here on earth. See, we're just passing through, folks. But you need to be born again. You need to make sure that you're saved. Now, Peter, back in First Peter chapter five, he says, "Now, folks." You know, I know that you're perse I know you're being persecuted. And by the way, Peter, apparently, according to tradition, was hung upside down because he didn't want to have the same kind of death that Jesus did. Now, in a way, he probably died a lot sooner than Jesus did, being hung upside down. But you look at the early disciples. All of them, with the exception of the Apostle John, died by martyrdom, according to church history. But he says, in light of all of this now, folks, be sober. Be, don't be drunk with wine. Be vigilant. Be watchful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Now, he's not a real lion. This is a figurative speech. He's seeking those whom he might devour or overwhelm. So he says, resist him. Now, you resist him after you've put on the armor. After you've been aware, he's attacking me in my mind. The temptation is not the sin. It's yielding to the temptation that is sin. So he says, stand fast in the faith, in the body of truth, the specific truth that deals with how to overcome the devil. See? You have different truth that deals with how to overcome the sin nature and a different truth that has to do with overcoming the world system. There are three different ways. And you need to recognize in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You know, oh, poor old me, I'm the only one that's suffering this way for God. Oh. Well, that's a, that's a form of pride, folks, when you think that you're the only one. And I'll tell you, when I was growing up, I thought, man, nobody else has the problems that I have. First Corinthians ten thirteen makes it very clear, folks. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. He will make a way of escape in order that you might be able to bear. Now, the problem is we don't study the word. We don't put ourselves at the disposal of somebody who can teach us the word. That's why God gave pastors and evangelists to the church, primarily pastors, that are like the pediatricians, the Evangelists like the uh, like the obstetrician that bring the babies into the world. Then the pastor teacher, he's like the pediatrician, help people grow so they can reproduce themselves. See? Let me ask you, when was the last time you led somebody to a saving knowledge of Christ? Now, you know, I think that you can still earn the crown of rejoicing if you're involved in the process of helping people get saved. But you know, so many people say, well, let the pastor, let the deacon, let the Sunday school teacher do it. Oh, my friend, you're missing out on so much. See? 
You need to be rightly related to the Holy Spirit. You need to be walking by the Spirit and have your known sins confessed to God. And when you're in that position, when you're being led by the Holy Spirit, you carry gospel tracts with you. You share it with people. I talked to a man just this morning. And he told, I told him about our son Bill and how he died. And he told me that he was the stepfather of the young gal here in town who died at a very young age. I tell you, there's a lot of people like that in our world. See? And you, I told him, I said, you're not planning on dying today, are you? He said, no. I said, but you could, right? And I want to tell people the good news concerning Christ. The gospel is that he died for our sins, your sins and mine. You're a sinner. like You haven't been as bad as you could be, right? But you're as bad off as you could be if you're an unsaved person. You're headed for hell. John 3, uh, verse number 18 says, The unbelievers, they are, the wrath of God abides on them. See? If they die without Christ as their Savior, they've committed the unpardonable sin. They're not going to be saved. See? That's where you and I can come in, my friend. And I hope you will. In the power of the Holy Spirit, share the good news. You might, be a, you might not be bombastic like I am. See? You might be a very quiet person type of a person. It doesn't make any difference whether you... I don't want you to be like me because I'm my own worst enemy. I want you to be whom God wants you to be. And allow the Holy Spirit to use you for His glory and for the good of others. Well, i got to wrap it up here. I've gone a little longer than I'd planned to, but I've been thinking about sharing this with you, and I shared some of these thoughts with our folks recently. And, and I know that all, when all whom the Father has given to the Son have come to Him, the father's going to say to God the Son, go get your bride, son. Now, when I we talk about God the Son, it doesn't mean that he came into existence sometime after the Father. He's not the first one whom the Father created, as some of the cults teach. You see. He shares an absolute equality with the Father and the Holy Spirit. But he did take to himself, he added to his deity, a true human nature and a human body. When he came some 2,000 years ago, this is the one in whom people must believe in order to be saved. Now, if you're having struggles in your own life and you need, I have a whole lot of things on my blog site. I'll, you can go to that, um, dealing with the other areas, dealing with the specific areas where the devil attacks us. And um, I haven't counted how many blogs I've written over the years, but they're for you. Uh, the references that uh, I've made, references to some of these already, I'll have a link for you to go there. And I would encourage you to make time to study the Word. Not, you know, and don't believe it just because I say so. Base it upon what the Word of God has to say, because it's the Scripture that is the authority, not me. I'm not the final authority. Once in a while, I, my words slip up, and they come out the wrong way. And even then, see, I realize the responsibility. James 3 one says, don't take teaching lightly. If I'm teaching you error, I'm, God's going to hold me accountable for that. And I'm thankful for the privilege that I have to serve in this local church where I do right now. But I want to extend this to you, who might be all around the world. Some of you might be my friends as a result of our son Bill's putting you, making you my friend. You can have an impact upon other people by simply pushing share. And this message will go to your friends. It might go to their friends. It might go to their friends. And when we get the job done, folks, I don't want to stay around in this world when the tribulation, and I'm not going to be here. That's another subject in itself. I feel sorry for those who are so frustrated Oh, I'm afraid I'm going to go through the, through the tribulation. No, you won't. You might be persecuted. It says all who live godly will suffer persecution, but you're not going to go through the tribulation. It's quite clear from the scriptures. Well, we're here to help you if we can. Uh, we'd appreciate if you like this. If you don't like it, let us know as well. But push like if you like it. And push share over here. And uh, let's together work for the glory of God and for the good of others. And I hope you'll have a make it a great day for the glory of God. Talk to you later again, Lord willing.